Okay, I think uh, we're ready to get going. Thank you everyone uh, for being with us. I'm Shabani Joshi and welcome to this session with Change Healthcare. Today, we're gonna explore how securely leveraging key social determinants of health or SDOHs um, can better inform provider approaches for individual health and accelerate a consumer-friendly return to normalcy both now and after the COVID pandemic is over with the help of the vaccine passport. Joining us to dig into this topic today are Tim Suther, the SVP and General Manager of Data Solutions at Change Healthcare. We also have Chris Joshi, the EVP of Network Solutions at Change Healthcare as well. Welcome to you both. Before we get started, we want to remind our audience that this is an interactive session and we definitely want to hear from you. Please use the text chat on the right hand side of your screen, ask questions, engage with the discussion, and we'll get to as many questions as we can during the interview. But with that, let's just kick things right off. Chris, we're going to start with you first. Um, talk us through and walk us through the outlook for getting back to normal. You say that there's two important components for this to happen. Walk us through what those two components are. Well, thanks, Shivani, and it's great to join you today. So as we look towards getting back to normal, we need to keep two key objectives in focus. The first is the science, and the second is the consumer experience as we get through all of this together. Right. So first of all, on the science side, we are still struggling with some key scientific questions, especially with the new variants emerging. How long will immunity last? Does it wane sooner for these new variants compared to what we knew before? Mm -hmm. How will we even know when people who are vaccinated are getting infected again with new variants? Will these new variants require modified vaccines? If so, how soon? Mm -hmm. And these questions will require rapid collection and analysis of observational data as the vaccines are rolling out. We all love cl clinical studies and controlled clinical trials are really the most rigorous way of collecting data and analyzing data, mm -hmm. but those tr trials take time. And so we have to make sure that we supplement them with high quality observational data that's coming in as the vaccination is going on. And we now have the capability to do that. The second part is the consumer experience. As much as we think about the pandemic and the vaccination as a healthcare event, as a healthcare related issue, vaccination itself is also a huge consumer issue. Right. Due to the pure magnitude of people who are impacted, right? It's, it's almost like rolling out a consumer product in some sense. Absolutely. We have to trust. We have to provide a convenient and consumer friendly experience. And if we feel, if people feel that their vaccination experience from the appointment scheduling all the way to getting the vaccine and the passport afterwards, is a convenient and a great experience. They're gonna tell their friends and family, it's gonna help us address resistance to vaccination, and it's gonna speed up the whole process and get us back to normal faster. So thankfully, these two dual goals are both important, but they're very complementary and synergistic. Absolutely, that word of mouth and that ex consumer experience um, creates an impact that you can't ever work yourself or market yourself um, uh, away from. If there's a bad experience, then it has a long, a long tail effect. Um, Tim, let's talk about social determinants of health or SDOHs. We hear a lot of that in the news. Um, tell us what that means and why they are so important and integral um, in this time of COVID. Well, our health and wellness, it depends not just on the care that we receive from doctors, hospitals, and pharmacies. Up to 80% of our health and wellness is determined by what the healthcare community describes as social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. These social determinants effectively are factors about your life occurring outside the doctor's office that could affect your health. So what are, what are some examples of that? Well, one of those is where you live. Uh, you know, do you have healthy foods available in your neighborhood to buy from the grocery store? Do you have stable housing? Mm -hmm. Can you, in fact, access and, uh, transportation to receive care? And if you can't receive care in person, do you have broadband to receive it virtually? Another factor is your income. You know, can you actually afford health care? Another factor is health literacy, your knowledge of health care. You know, it influences whether you exercise, whether you eat healthy, and in fact, determines whether you think vaccines are a good idea or know how to get one right. or know that for most of them, you need two doses 
And unfortunately, your health and wellness is also often closely associated with your race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So returning to normal means understanding, yes, what is going on in the doctor's office, but also life outside it. With the vaccines upon us now, now more than ever, it's critical to understand and act on those uh, unique circumstances of patients' lives that actually determine their health and well-being. Absolutely. And those were some of the key topics that were addressed in some of the previous sessions, um, panelists as well. Chris, the vaccine passport will be a crucial vehicle in enabling this return to normal. We're all looking forward to it. Um, tell us what it is and what problems it will solve. So a vaccine passport is a very simple, verifiable credential that allows one to provide proof of vaccination to anyone when required. Think of it like your airline boarding pass. It shows up on your phone, it's got a QR code on it. Anyone can scan your passport using a mobile phone and get a quick confirmation of vaccination. Mm -hmm. But it's basically a credential provided by your physician or your pharmacy or the hospital or the site where you got vaccinated. And it can be sent to you as a simple text message with a link to the passport. So it's really consumer friendly, it's very simple, it's lightweight. It can be printed if needed, just like a boarding pass. And ideally, a passport is secure, private, and limited. In other words, it's not your entire medical record. It doesn't need to be. It has just enough information that is easy to share when needed and nothing more, right? So a passport does three things. First, it provides the verifiable proof of vaccination where required, mm -hmm. whether it's a boarding a flight or at a school or at an event. Secondly, it allows follow-up to be simplified and be more controlled. In other words, if you get your second shot at a different location than you got your first shot, they might not have any information about what your first shot was. Good point, yeah. You shouldn't have to, re to rely on your memory or you might lose a piece of paper. This is important because the second shot has to match the first shot. If you're going into a location that doesn't know you from before, you don't want to have to scramble to find that information. And the third thing it does, it allows quick follow-up. Let's say you've been vaccinated three, four months ago and there's follow-up information that public health advisories that want to get, get out to you, such as information about the vaccine you got or the need for a booster shot that might be available as new strains of the virus emerge. This follow-up communication with the consumer or with the patient also is facilitated. So those are the three benefits of the vaccine passport. Tim, let's fold in here the SDOH analytics into the vaccine passport. How will this information be protected? Because as Chris said, it's a simple solution, but with a very complex back end and that data protection is going to be key um, for consumer experience, but also um, overall protection, obviously. That's a, that's a great point. You know, we, we all experience healthcare differently. You know, you might've won the ovarian lottery you know, inheriting great genetics from your, your parents, uh, resulting in low predisposition to disease. You know, your social determinants of health may, might be favorable, but not all Americans are, are so lucky. You know, over the past year, we've been working with academic medical centers across the country to better understand COVID, how it progresses, what therapies work, its impact on pre-existing conditions, and so much more. And that research has told us that COVID infections hospitalizations and mortality have disproportionately affected minority, economically vulnerable, and low health uh, literacy communities. Furthermore, the rate of vaccination for these vulnerable populations is also far below their rate of infection and their percent of the overall population. You know, with vaccines, uh, we have both a supply and a demand problem. You know, the progress with vaccines has been borderline miraculous. Uh, but yet we still don't have enough of them to go around. Social determinants can help prioritize uh, distribution to those most at risk. And there are still some that are reluctant to take the vaccine. And while some are swayed by misinformation, often it's as simple as not knowing where to get a vaccine or how to sign up. Now the bottom line is you can't address vaccine reluctance with one size fits all messaging. So no doubt healthcare is a, uh, is a sensitive matter. You know, as uh, they said in Spider-Man, you know, with uh, great power comes great responsibility. And that's true with uh, healthcare data as well. Fortunately, numerous federal and state regulations govern healthcare data, including HIPAA, which yeah. is our country's national privacy law for healthcare data. But leaders will treat that regulation as a floor, not a ceiling, and embrace a, a higher ethical use standard 
to systematically ensure that there is no adverse impact or any other unintended uh, outcomes. The bottom line here is that healthcare data is among the most rigorously protected of any kind of data and deservedly so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and that, um, that protection being maintained in the vaccine passport is going to be essential and crucial. And Chris, let's let's stick on um, the concept of, of different state and local guidelines. Can state and local health officials leverage accessible vaccine tracking and SDOH data to inform their distribution strategy? Because we know it differs state by state. And do you see the need for a single vaccine passport, similar to your explanation of, of a passport to get on a plane by, issued by the government, or are we going to see many different solutions and d- different vaccine passports out, out there? It's a great question, Shivani. As Tim mentioned, social determinants data can certainly help inform vaccine distribution. It can also help localize the strategy because it connects you with the community. And that makes community outreach easier, especially in vulnerable populations. And it's really important to build trust where there's still some hesitancy to vaccination. So yes to that, the social determinants data can and should be leveraged at the state and local levels to really inform distribution. The important thing about the passport is that it should be an open standards based and interoperable passport. It is not necessary for there to be a single passport, like a government issued passport or something like that. Just like we have different credit cards, right? They're issued by different banks, but they all still work at all the merchants because they're based on standards. That's why we at Change Healthcare decided that we should work with an open consortium of providers, pharmacies, and health tech companies. And we started doing this back in the fall because that kind of a consortium can create a standard, an open standard that's interoperable and that's free to use for anyone. Let's we all, go, go ahead, Chris. So we can also serve as a certified issuer for pharmacies or for providers mm-hmm. who want to issue a passport for free. And we do that to make it easy for providers and pharmacies to issue a passport without really creating additional workflow overhead. We all know that as these physicians and frontline health workers are scrambling to get you know, shots in people's arms, last thing they need is more paperwork. So since we are one of the larger healthcare networks in the country and we already have connectivity and we have data flowing from all of these providers typically, we felt that we could just turn on some switches and help them in this area without creating additional work or imposing additional costs on them as they're all trying to get us vaccinated. Yeah, that's so true. And, and you, you, you're you bringing up the, the notion of different pain points along the channels, right? There's so many different pain points and this, vac- this vaccine passport needs to solve so many of them in order to be an ideal solution. We've got some questions here from the audience we want to, um, we want to throw your way. Uh, we have this one from Jay Goff. How can we integrate all of the various data formats into meaningful data uh, lakes and then open them to research. Tim? Uh, happily, a lot of the data for research is already uh, coming in a standardized format. As uh, Chris mentioned, um, one of the uh, byproducts of Change Healthcare's role as the central nervous of healthcare, central nervous system of healthcare in America is that we are processing data about diagnoses and procedures and drugs every single every single day and the industry has done a good job of standardizing the coding conventions for that and the file layouts for that so the position that we've taken is not to introduce a new standard but rather to uh, capture uh, the information as it is flowing through the network with appropriate uh, permissions to rigorously de-identify it and then to have very rigorous uh, controls over use. And uh, the use that was suggested about research is exactly uh, one of our top priorities. You know, if people experience healthcare differently than having the ability to understand their clinical uh, profile is a part of the equation. And the rest of the equation is making sure that you deeply understand the uh, circumstances of that individual's life, because it will have a bearing on their rate of utilization and their ultimate success uh, with uh, any proposed uh, therapy. 
we've got just about two to three minutes left. Um, and I want to ask you, Tim, and feel free to throw something in as well, Chris. What is the long-term potential with the vaccine passport? Let's envision this very happy place where COVID is behind us. Um, where does the vaccine passport go next? Does it have a place? Uh, that would be a happy place, wouldn't it? And I, uh, I look forward to that. Um, but it's important to remember that uh, COVID may stay with us a while. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't know, uh, albeit at a less uh, severe impact, we don't know how long the vaccines are going to remain effective. There are mutations that are still emerging. So we think that passports and social determinants are critical elements of a learning healthcare system. You know, again, we all experience healthcare differently. And those differences are a big reason why our country spends twice per capita any other developed country on healthcare, and we rank number 43 in the world in life expectancy. We, we can do better. That's what a learning health system should do. And to tackle that problem, you know, we need to understand patients more holistically. Yes, their clinical profile, but also their social determinants. If we're able to do that, care is gonna be more precisely matched to the individual circumstances of the patient. We'll do a better job with preventative health care. Patients will be more likely to adhere to their therapies. Standards of care will be more uh, frequently tuned with social determinants and research will actually incorporate those variances to determine what therapies are best for you. And finally, clinical trials will be a whole lot more inclusive. So if we can do all that, you know, that's certainly going to generate a much happier and healthier place for, for all of us. That is a tall order, but something that we all can agree that it, it is um, all necessary and the next step in, in equitable and um, really next level healthcare. Chris, any final words for us? Well, I'll only say that, you know, this uh, COVID pandemic and our efforts towards vaccination have shown how agile we can be. We brought mm -hmm. a vaccine to market and credit to all the people who worked uh, hard to make that happen. It has set a high bar for the kind of quick response people will expect in the future. And I hope we can also take this opportunity to make healthcare a little bit more consumer friendly through this vaccination process and show people that uh, even as fragmented a healthcare system that we are, we can sometimes, you know, when needed, come together and work together and, and coordinate to make life easier for our populations. Yes, thank you very much. It's been an interesting and an insightful conversation. Tim and Chris, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, thank you for your questions as well. And thank you to Change Healthcare for their sponsorship of this event. You can now head back to the stage tab for Meg Terrell's interview with Johnson & Johnson Chairman and CEO, Alex Gorski. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. you.